Raji, I thought you were going to jump over there and jump down in the seat. I want to uh, welcome you all to what I hope will be a very good session in terms of the give and take. Uh, we're trying to focus on this, what startups in the room would want to learn. So while we really want to talk about Sprinkler, Raji, I'm going to ask you to share your experiences on growing a company from a startup to a unicorn and how you constantly reinvented yourself, the company, and direction. So start off, describe to the group what Sprinkler is and, and how you made a difference in the market to achieve your growth to date. So Sprinkler is a enterprise social media management platform. And what that means is it allows you, uh, it allows large brands to do advertising, marketing, research, customer care, and engagement on one unified platform across 34 social media and messaging channels. So I had the chance to lead Cisco for 20 years. Now I get the pick of the litter of startups around the world to work with. Uh, one of the things that fascinated me, about, fascinated me about Sprinkler is you've got a marketing transition, and you've also got distinguishing the customer relationship for most products are alike. How do you do that, and how do you think of it in terms of the, the transition you're leading in terms of technology? It was uh, market driven. The unique thing about social media is that the customers don't follow instructions. So if you have a Facebook page or a Twitter account, and let's say you're Microsoft, you don't get to dictate what the customers want you to say or do on that channel. So you may have posted a, a coupon for uh, an Xbox, but if a customer complains under that advertisement or that message, then you have to get customer care involved. And if there's a product problem, you may have to get the product team involved. You may have to get your corp corporate communications involved. So we saw the power that the customer has, the modern customer has early on when we are creating the platform, a social media management platform, and that laid the foundation for what we are doing now, which is really a unified way to manage customer experiences across all customer-facing departments and functions. It's changed so dramatically. When I led Cisco, if we had a critical situation, I'd immediately be notified, but we'd work on it over the next couple of days, position it with the customer, et cetera. Today, the customers almost expect a response regardless of which channel they use into your company within five minutes. 95% of the customers. And so how do you make this complex concept with 24 different channels, if you will, as well as their traditional channels. How do you bring it together? Yeah, it's so it's a foundationally a very simple idea. Today, all customer-facing teams and functions, be it marketing, be it advertising, be it research or customer care, they operate in silos. They operate in channel-centric silos. So I've got an email customer care team, I've got an email marketing team, I got my call center team. Whereas the customer is expecting the brand to be a unified entity that can speak and respond in one unified tone. So the simple idea is how do we bring these different customer facing teams onto one platform with a unified set of workflows and the ability to collaborate with a shared context of who that customer is. So I've got to be in full interest uh, and disclosure. I'm a major investor there and on the board of directors. So I'm a little bit biased about how good you are. But let's switch more to sharing experiences. All of us who invest and all of us who do startups think we're straight up and to the right, right? And we're not. It, we are tremendous highs, tremendous lows. And almost all startups have a problem every other week. You've managed through 10 years of this. What have been your biggest successes? And then you know what I'm going to ask you next. Um, the biggest success that Sprinkler has is basically our core DNA. Our core DNA is, you know, is what refer, people refer to as culture. And our culture has three parts to it. The first one is we're absolutely obsessed with customers and their success. The second thing is we treat everyone at Sprinkler, all employees, as family. So that comes with a tax that you pay to be in their lives, be a part of their success and their failure. Um, and three, everything we do, we do it with such high quality so we can take pride in the work we do and who we are. So when you think about the role of a CEO or a management team in this room, there are four jobs you have. Vision and strategy for the company, 
develop, recruit, retain, and change the leadership team. Culture, which is mo where most companies make the mistake, startups not understanding how important it is, and then communications. And communications is now an art. Paint the picture of your company five years from now. Sprinkler five years from now would be what? But I'm asking each person in the audience to do the same thing for your own company. So many startups take the steps one step at a time, as opposed to say, here's the goal and work backwards. Sprinkler five years from now is? Um, five years from now, if you pay attention, you know whether Sprinkler has been successful in meeting my expectations. If you hear this one word, one word, and you think of Sprinkler, if you hear the word happier, and you can identify Sprinkler with that word, then I know Sprinkler has been successful to the extent I wanted it to be in five years. Because Sprinkler's mission is to enable every organization on the planet to make their customers happier. And we can't make people happy because there's so many things going on in life. But every organization can make customers happier if they can listen to them, if they can learn what makes that customer happier, and if they can deliver that and show that they care for that customer. So each company in this room, how many of you are with companies of 100 people or less? How many 500 or less? How many? 1,500 or less. How many over 1,500? So what happens, these are the common breakpoints in a company. As a VC from the outside, and I bought 180 companies at Cisco, so I watched how they developed and bought 12 unicorns. There's usually a break at 100 people where the companies really struggle to go on to the next level, and that's where most of them disappear. Uh, then again, at about 500, then about 1,500. You've managed through this. Uh, the first two transitions went well. The second one was a little bit more challenging. Share what happens as you evolve through each of these and what each one of these uh, people in the room will go through and perhaps your lesson learned that if you had to do it differently, at which stage would you have done it differently and why? Mm -hmm. So John, you're absolutely right. The companies go through the stages to set the context. Sprinkler is uh, over $300 million in revenue. Uh, we are about 1,400, 1,500 people, 24 offices around the world. Um, so we went through the first two stages pretty well and choked on the third stage and thankfully got out of it uh, in, in a large measure because of your help and, and your coaching for me. So there are three aspects that I, I'm not going to talk about product market fit and strength of your vision. That's a granted. If you don't have it, you don't have anything. Yep. Um, but assuming you have that, at every stage, I think three things get tested. The first thing that gets tested in my mind is culture. Is your culture strong enough or you start disintegrating as you go past 100 people or 500 people or three levels of leadership or six levels of leadership? So have you, are you recodifying your culture? Are you training and enabling people on culture at every stage? The second thing is leadership. So I, I go with culture first because your culture is what's going to allow you to bring great leaders on. And so it starts with culture. The second thing is leadership. So people break, leaders break at different stages and few leaders can continue to scale but it's the job of the CEO to understand who's scaling and who's not and bring in the right leadership to serve the company during that stage. And the last thing is execution. When you are a small company, you really shouldn't put a lot of processes in because it slows you down. Um, and as you go through each stage, you have to, each stage you have to codify things more and more but continue to be nimble so you can break through and go on to the next stage. So those are my sort of three takeaways. So everybody that gets up in front of you the next couple of days will talk about their achievements. What I'm going to ask Raji to do is share what it's like when we get knocked on our backside. Yeah. And for me as an investor, I know we're never going to have a great company until he gets knocked down and the company comes back from it. And most companies don't come back. So think about when you get knocked down. We were at 1,500 people. You were already a unicorn setting the world on fire, and yet you probably stayed with the same leadership too, too long and probably assumed the culture was just naturally occurring. Share with the audience kind of the lessons learned because your takeaways here is a leader is more the product of her 
of his or her setbacks and how they recover than their successes. Share with the lessons learned, if so you So I'm going to give you the obvious one, building on what we just talked about. We realized that our culture was not codified. So we were not hiring for culture. We were not recruiting for culture. So as a result, the culture was getting watered down. Yes. Number two, we had in, in some areas brought on the leadership that we needed for the next stage of the company. And number three, we had in, we're defining a new market. We're defining a new industry and we had in codified our processes to execute against the playbook each time. But those are the obvious answers. Now, I'm probably going to give you what I think is the single biggest takeaway from this session, at least from my perspective. All right. Um, because when you go through these journeys, it's very tempting to think that, hey, I got a problem with leadership, or I got a problem with product, or I got a problem with sales. But I can tell you, every problem that I've faced, when you go to the very, very core of the issue, it was my inability to operate at that next level. If I don't have leadership, if you go back and ask yourself, are you able to recruit the right leaders? What do you have to learn? So at every level, the insight for me that I, I think I have now, that I didn't seem to have through earlier part of my journey at Sprinkler, was what do you have to be? What is it that you need to learn? And that's where our uh, partnering up, and my, my biggest blessing in the last three years has been meeting John. And, and John, by the way, if you don't know, is one of the top three business leaders alive. To have the privilege, and, and at one point, Cisco was the largest company on the planet. So to be able to learn from him, and that came from a, a moment realizing that, my God, like the number one thing I can do for Sprinkler is be a better leader. And what's the number one thing you can do if you want to learn? Find the best teacher you can. So how many of you in the room have a mentor for your company, a true coach? Yeah, and that's the problem. You want to get people who've seen the movie before. Raji was very kind in his comments. I've seen every movie there is. I've made every mistake there is to make. Growth covers up a lot of that. But having somebody with you that can kind of say, here's your alternatives. In the end, the management team has to run it. But to say, here's how you think about culture, et cetera. How many of you believe it's so important to be loyal to your employees? Exactly. And what's the mistake you're going to make? You're going to keep everybody too long. And so you have to realize that as your company evolves, it's important to be loyal, which you and I both are to the employees. But you, in the end, ended up changing about 60% of your leadership team. Walk through the group. Why did you do that? Did you stay too long with people that you were loyal to? But yet you kept the culture and you reinvented it, in my, my words a little bit the process you went through. So as you are going through your journey, you always, you're going to be torn between um, what the company needs and your loyalty to people. And I've struggled with, with, and I think all great leaders struggle with that because you, you want to build a culture where you're loyal to employees. Um, and the big lesson is to really understand that sometimes the best thing you can do to an employee is set that person free. If you really want the right thing for that person, it's not good for the employee to be at a place where he or she is not respected, is not delivering, because most human beings want to live life being successful, being respected, getting pats on the back for doing a great job where they are. When you stick with someone for longer than they should be in that role, First thing you got to do is explain to them what the next level looks like. Not like buy low, sell high kind of way. Not like, brother, I need you to step it up. But in a very quantifiable way. Like if you are in sales, you need to close $100 million in bookings. And you are at 70. What does it take to get to 100 in a data-driven way? To coach that person and, and help connect that person to people who can help them so that give that person has a chance to elevate his game if he or she is able to. Now three, when it's not in a data-driven way, then it's very easy to have that conversation, say you probably should be at a company, at an environment where your skills can be celebrated and it's a better fit 
for that company at that stage than it is at your company at this stage. And you treat them with a lot of respect on their way out, which is something John taught me the hard way. Well, I've seen the movies. How many of you have had a near-death experience at your company? A couple of you raised your hand. <coughs> you will never have a company that survives until you've been through that process. Raji, you got knocked down. Explain to the group what it feels like, and then how do you approach getting back up? How do you bring your customers, your leadership team? Because you're stronger now than ever. The sales forecast is going through the roof. Uh, your investors are happy. Your board, who's a challenging board, loves you, uh, and they're extremely happy. But walk through what it's like for those who have not been through this, because you will never have a great company. And Jack Welch, the historic leader of GE, taught me that 30 years ago. So what does it feel like and how do you get through it? Uh, and what kind of lessons learned would you share with this group? So the first thing is, uh, I think we're only getting started. It's a $100 billion market. We're what? 0.3% done. So yes. uh, I think we have a long way to go and, and I'm all excited about doing this together with you and, and the team at Sprinkler. So when you go back, um, say a prayer for Sprinkler, we got a long way to go. Having said that, um, as you go through these moments, and I refer to this, you know, moments of darkness, when you're unable, you, you're, you're unable to kind of clearly understand what needs to change and or you're unable to make those changes. Um, and the key is to separate the situation from you and really be analytical about what needs to happen for things to change. And if you haven't learned it already, you will. Um, most of the world uh, wants to be your friend when things are good. Absolutely. And, and so when you're growing, like we did early on, 300%, 200%, you know, 100%, doubling, tripling, every investor wanted to be a part of Sprinkler, every magazine wanted to write. But when you go through your moments of darkness, it's just you. It's a very lonely place. And so this is why it's very important to establish relationships early on, not just with fair weather friends and investors and partners, but with people who are, who can be mentors, who can be teachers in those dark periods, because if you go looking for them when you are in a dark period, you're unlikely to find them. So the respect I have for you, and I've said this to you privately, um, and I'll say this publicly, was John walked in at one of these years. Well, we were still growing 20%, but we should have been growing like 50%. And he walked in saying, I'm going to back you up. I'm going to believe in you. And, and that was a memorable moment for me in my entire life, but I got lucky. And what I would do if I were doing this again is when you have years where you are crushing it, I'd go find someone like you that I can trust when things go wrong. Yeah, Raji's being very kind. He's recruited an amazing leadership team and evolved his board. Uh, if there's a takeaway for this group, if you were sitting out in the audience seven years ago and yeah. you're 10, 10 years old in terms of the company and you wanted one point that you wish somebody had told you then, somebody sitting up on stage who's done it like you've done it, uh, that Barn and Surprise is going to create a tremendously valuable company and you built a momentum that can't, even the big guys can't slow down. What would be your takeaway for the audience that they could learn from? You guys are ready for this? There's only one person on this planet that you can change. Who's that? It's you. So if you go back, just be very hard because most people don't bother changing themselves but want everyone else around to change and it doesn't happen. And what you really have to learn in, when you go through moments of darkness is that you're failing to change the only person you can change. So you have to be, you have to be thirsty to learn in any way you can be through books, to be through mentors, um, and chase the seven C's in quest of that learning. Disrupt or you're going to be disrupted. Change or you're going to get changed. Raji, you've been an amazing person to work with. Thank you very much and thank the audience. Thank you. It's fun, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.